a very good morning, good afternoon to you all from wherever you are tuning in. My name is Liz Ntonjira, the Director of Global Communications at Amref Health Africa. I'll be taking you through this really exciting and engaging session dubbed Effective Communication to Combat Health Misinformation. You know, with the advent of you know um, new media, there's been a lot of communication. Access to information has been easier than it has ever been before. And with me is a panel, an exciting panel that will be shedding more light and insights around misinformation and disinformation. I'm joined by Emmanuel Lubanzadio. He's the head of public policy for Sub-Sahara Africa at Twitter. Dr. Ifioma Teresa Amobi, the senior lecturer in mass communication, University of Lagos in Nigeria. Ian Wafula, a broadcast journalist from BBC Africa here in Kenya. Rachel Anamusi, the CEO of VN Sync, who's joining us from the UK. Jackie Opara Fatuye, who's the Regional Deputy Director um, at Africa Science Focus Podcast at SciDev.net Sub Sahara Africa. Thank you all so much for joining us. If you want to listen in in French, please do go to the interpretation. Um, it's sort of like a world map where you can pick um, the language of your preference. Uh, we will try to keep the answers very short and to the point. We will be launching a poll during this session just to get um, a pulse of whether or not you think it, the access to information is a blessing or a curse. So this session is also being recorded and will be available after the conference as a resource um, on the platform, and we're happy to share this as well in the form of a newsletter to our distribution list. Now, as you all know, information access is really critical, particularly during a pandemic. Now, more than ever, the need for communication, the need for advocacy cannot be emphasized further. We've had um, yesterday uh, in the beginning of the conference, which was day one, where we had the key guest, the president of Kenya, His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta did mention that communication, um, you know, to strengthen health sector collaboration and coordination across different levels of government needs a lot of advocacy, um, communication and information dissemination, which is really, really critical. And the explosion of mobile connectivity and social media over the past decade has created great opportunities uh, for people to share information, learn and connect across geographies. But at the same time, it has presented a new challenge, an overload of information that the World Health Organization defined as an infodemic. Very quickly, I'd like to hear from our distinguished panelists whether or not um, this access to information and how easy it has become, whether it's a blessing or a curse. And I'll start with Jackie. Jackie, you're on mute. Hello, so. yeah. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. We've been working on this for a long time. And I think that social media is a double-edged sword because it has positive and negative consequences because people are people easily have access to social media tools so it's easy for them to spread information whether it is factual or not so but because the people that have the fact also have access to these platforms they can also use it so it has positive and negative consequences Okay, absolutely. Um, Emmanuel, having been in this social media institution, um, I definitely, I think you think it's a blessing. <laughs> of course, I think it's a blessing. No, uh, I, I think kind of to piggyback on what you said in the beginning uh, with, with this pandemic, I think I definitely think it's a blessing for one. And we've actually seen that all around the world is people, how Twitter and social media in general has been connecting people with credible health information, which, you know, which they need to protect themselves and their loved ones. Um, and I think the many campaigns that we have shared and started in partnership with so many organizations wouldn't have been possible without an open and free internet. So as such, I do think that access to information, uh, particularly through the internet, are definitely a blessing. 
Thank you. Thank you for that, Emmanuel. Rachel, I know you um, offer consultancy services for a myriad of organizations, civil society groups, the government, private sector. Is it a blessing or a curse in your perspective? You're mute, sorry. I think it's 100% a blessing. Um, I, information has been completely democratized. Uh, people can align with stories now that, that resonate with their humanity as opposed to uh, any kind of narrative that is only being shared by whoever has the deepest pockets, which is basically what media used to be. Either you can buy a front page or you don't get heard. So um, I read a, a, a statistic somewhere that says all of the world's information has been most 90% of the world's information has been created in the last two years. That gives you an idea of how much information we're putting out there. So the blessing is global. It is appreciated by all, but without filters, without regulation, without something putting this thing together and saying, well, what should float to the top and what should stay closer to the bottom? We are just going to have anarchy. Okay, great. To bring in a very important point around regulation, which we'll get into a little bit later. Now to Dr. Moby, who has a PhD in matters information dissemination, in your years, you know, of study and expertise, is it a blessing or a curse? Sorry, you're on mute. <laughs> I would say that access to information is both a blessing and a curse. A blessing in the sense that I can sit in the comfort of my personal library at home and access information or research materials from almost every reputable library in the entire world without having to travel. You know, and then, you know, um, the internet or the World Wide Web, the originators had intended for it to be a democratic media where everybody can have access to whatever information they so wish to have. However, people have weaponized this and turned it into the monster that it has become today, to the extent that it's been referred to as infodemic. You know, the fact that the deluge of information available, sometimes on, on demand, other times not on demand, contains false, falsehood a lot of times. And this is even worse when it is health information. Because health information, when it is false, is capable of leading people to take dangerous decisions or make the wrong health-seeking behaviors. And this is especially the case when people possess low media literacy levels and are unable to identify or evaluate manipulated information. So to that extent, I think that it is both a blessing and a curse. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mobi. Very powerful sentiments on how, you know, communication and the access to it has been weaponized. Going to you, Ian Wafula, um, do you think it's a blessing or a curse? Uh, thank you, Liz. I actually do agree with Dr. Amobi, and I've really struggled with the poll because I, I, on my part, I think maybe there would be a third option to say both. Uh, because prior to COVID-19, when I'd cover fake news and uh, misinformation stories, and when I talk at forum like, forums like this, I, would, uh, I used to say that misinformation thrives in the absence of information. Now, after COVID-19, I'm finding that actually misinformation thrives in the presence of an overflow of information, like what we're experiencing right now, what the WHO says is an infodemic. So the question is, how do you find the balance? And also, how do you combat this in a place where it's a double-edged sword, Liz? Okay. Thank you so much, Ian, for that. Um, to our audience, remember, we've launched a poll um, asking you, do you think access to information is a blessing or a curse? Please do put in your answer into the poll and we will share the results. Remember, if you have any questions to the panelists, there's the Q&A um, and there's the, there's the Q&A section where you can put those questions and we have the results out. So out of 71 of you that are here, 96% of you think that the access to information is a blessing and 4% feel that it is um, 
four percent feel it is a cast. It would be interesting to hear the perspectives from those uh, that four percent. Now, going to something really interesting that emanated from what Rachel did talk about, and that was about regulation. And I'm coming to you, Emmanuel. Um, do social media platforms have a responsibility to tackle misinformation and be held responsible for the content shared on their platforms? What is your perspective on that? Um, no, I, I think I think there's definitely a good question. Um, I would say there's a shared responsibility across various stakeholders. You have NGOs, you have, you have NGOs, you have industry, you have governments, you have schools, education, but also the institution of parenthood. Uh, but I think as a, uh, for, but mainly speaking from Twitter's perspective, um, you know, if you look at, if you take a look at our product policy and partnership and philanthropic initiatives that we've launched um, during, this, during this pandemic, uh, you will see that we've allocated quite a lot of efforts uh, to combat the issue of misinformation, right? So we all agree that the, pu that the public conversation happening on Twitter has been critically important during this pandemic, uh, more than ever, uh, you know, considering that with the critical mass of official government accounts, health experts and professionals, our goal has been to work in collaboration with different institutions to amplify credible health information, really to ensure that people have access to um, credible and accurate information on this pandemic, in order also to kind of deviate and get away from uh, or discouraging harmful behavior. So, you know, we've done so with partnerships uh, in over 30 countries. We have launched Twitter event pages, uh, com com you know, really consisting different health stakeholders that can provide credible health information. We have launched marketing campaigns. We've even worked with the WHO uh, with which we have hosted Q&As. Uh, we've also launched different global activations campaigns such as Wash Your Hands, uh, Healthy at Home, uh, Let's Talk campaign. So, you know, there are different kinds of things that we've done, but we've not only looked into COVID-19, um, but we've even looked beyond this because our collaboration with UNESCO has exemplified to this. We've then launched a, 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 a handbook for teachers and learners uh, encouraging media literacy. So uh, to kind of sum it up, I do think this is a shared responsibility that different stakeholders have and possess. But I think from a Twitter uh, perspective, we've, we've, we've done our work and we continue to do our work with different partnerships, really with the overall goal to amplify credible health information, but also looking into the root cause, which oftentimes is media literacy. So I've pointed out towards the handbook and different kind of works we'll be doing. We've also worked with AMWEB on the uh, journalist course. We'll be providing trainings on, on teaching journalists how Twitter can be used to amplify credible information. So this, this is also our initiative or rather commitment to show that we care about media literacy and also tackling health and misinformation. So yes, everybody has, a, there's a shared responsibility, but it's unfair to merely put, it, put the sole blame on social media, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. And particularly now that before you even retweet a story, um, there's the prompt that asks you, um, please read the story first before retweeting it. I think those are some good efforts from Twitter that we have seen. Dr. Moby, coming to you, um, you know, health communication has a lot of jargon. And I think that has been the biggest barrier in terms of health communication and the information dissemination. So when researchers, educators, and clinicians communicate um, to peers, the barriers of communications are typically low as we have a pre-existing vocabulary value system and shared interests. For outside audiences, for the common citizenry, what can these researchers and educators do to make the language easier for the masses to understand? Thank you, please, for that question. Um, I think the first thing you know for you to do when you want to send a message or you're designing a message is to know your audience. You should be able to identify the target audience. And if you have a large audience, you do what is called audience segmentation, where you break them down into groups. And when you know your audience, it means that you know their literacy, literacy level, you know their, you know their general demographics, their age, and so on. And so what you do when you do that, when you have identified your, your audiences, broken them into, then you develop or design the messages for each group to suit each group. 
and you know first and foremost you secondly you identify the goals of your communication having identified your goals what are the objectives of that communication what do you intend to achieve from that communication you know when you do that then you design the messages to suit that you, because you cannot for instance want to send a message to the you know the target audience that perhaps a group of market women and you use certain high falutin language you definitely if it's in nigeria perhaps you know use something like pidgin english that cuts across is a lingua that everybody virtually everybody can understand or you want to address women in the village in an ethnic area and then you use english language you have to identify the kind of language that you use that they will understand because if you do that you're introducing what is called semantic noise because it interferes with the meaning and that is when the communication process becomes ineffective because the process, the, the aim of the of communication is to you know achieve send the desired message to send the message to achieve the desired goals and objectives so if there's any interference it is called noise and the noise can be semantic so what you, you are referring to in terms of uh, using jargons is semantic noise in the communication process. So one has to do that to be aware of that semantic noise by identifying your target audience and designing your message in such a way to be meaningful to the target audience. Absolutely. You know, audience segmentation and target audience needs to be the key priority, whether you're in the media, whether you're a policymaker, um, whether you are whatever information that you're putting out, the target audience is really critical, which is a great segue to Ian, because Dr. Moby talked about, you know, addressing people in the authentic languages. And we know BBC has, for, in, for instance, BBC in Pidgin. Um, so in your perspective, a powerful way um, to create a personal connection in communication, particularly in the context of COVID-19, is through the use of personal stories and storytelling. However, science communication still struggles to connect with audiences because it is considered complicated, unrelatable, and lacking humanness. Now, as a journalist, or what is your advice to other peers as well, and members of the health fraternity, in ensuring that the stories that are created um, resonate with the target audience? Well, Liz, at the start of COVID-19 back in March, uh, the BBC came up with a special program, which I host and produce, that's the breakdown. And we were trying to see how can we uh, make this pandemic relatable? How can young people actually understand what's going on? This is the first time most of us are going through uh, the pandemic. And we started by telling very personal stories and I can quote two of them that I'm actually really happy and proud of. Uh, the first one was, uh, we realized that many older people are sharing lots of uh, misinformation with the younger generation and young people uh, like myself when, whenever our parents send us something we don't correct them so i realized how about i do a piece on teaching my very own mother the five key points of how to identify misinformation and i did a piece which actually uh, did really well on social media and i was literally telling my mom actually you are sending a lot of things that were actually making me anxious. So here are five key points uh, that you can use to identify uh, information. So kind of you, you make it personal. Another part of it is in towards the end of July, at least you know this, that I caught COVID and I did not hesitate to go public about this because I realized I had covered so many stories about misinformation that I realized people need to know how to deal with this. And I put my story out there and I documented my journey to recovery. And I got so many people reaching out to uh, tell me and ask uh, how they can actually deal with it themselves, given that they've also you know, in one way or another caught COVID or actually know someone who has caught COVID. So I feel like personalizing stories and also just breaking it down to make it relatable. Don't make your stories speak to the audience, but, but actually instead make them live through your story and that way they'll be able to understand the figures, they'll be able to understand the facts that are out there and just give it a, a human face. There's nothing wrong with being vulnerable with your story as a journalist or even putting yourself at the center of it just as long as at the end of the day you get the message communicated, please. 
Yeah, that was a very interesting story, Ian, on, you know, parents sending a lot of WhatsApps and I was getting that from my mother as well. And I actually sent you a piece to her so that she could watch it. And, and you know, and you know, when we talk about communication, it's not, you know, addressing huge numbers of people. It's by starting with the people closest to us. And that, that was a really excellent story. Now, Rachel, coming to you, um, would you say that there has been a more intentional effort on the part of media from Ian's perspective um, and social media giant, we've had the perspective of um, Emmanuel, um, to enhance the visibility of accurate information online and filter the content on their platforms, considering the explosion of misinformation and disinformation witnessed particularly during the pandemic? So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, when the um, COVID-19 broke out and there was all this news going on and things like that, and I thought, initially I thought, well, what more can they do? Um, Emmanuel has pointed out some amazing initiatives that um, Twitter, for one, uh, is took and is taking on the journey towards informing people and educating people, working with NGOs and things like that. And then the... Um, American elections happened <clears throat> and I saw some very, very deliberate actions taken by Twitter, by Facebook, by a lot of other um, media houses to make sure that misinformation wasn't spreading. And then I saw that actually we could do more when it comes to tech. The truth of the matter is, I believe you yourself, Liz, you've mentioned this here, is that unfortunately, and I hate to debase the conversation, health isn't sexy, right? You, you get a WHO and you have, what, 200 likes or maybe three shares. And then, you know, people are willing to share stuff about politics or about, I don't know, what the Kardashians are doing or whatever it is that they want to talk about. But then I saw that when it comes to health, it's either true or it's not. It, what the, w, the, the science either proves it or disproves it. So does it make sense, for example, to say it, it, the disparity where a president can be muted over spreading misinformation on electoral processes, but is allowed to say bleach is okay for ingestion. You, do you see the disparity where I start to think, actually, we're doing great work when it comes to putting the information out there, could we possibly do more when it comes to removing the oxygen and killing the fire on the misinformation? And I think that's what's important. I think it's a huge task and I certainly wouldn't leave it. So um, there's a Nigerian pastor, for example, who was spreading misinformation about COVID and he said it was a pandemic and he has substantial, incredible following and influence. And he was saying all of this stuff and he made people stop wearing masks and stuff because they said, oh, he completely weaponized and, po uh, and politicized the, the, pan the pandemic and started calling it a pandemic and saying, oh, it's been written. Oh, they knew all about it. Oh, there's something there about it. And the only time the government muted this pastor was when he linked it to the 5G. So they're trying to release 5G masks, and all of a sudden, what he's saying is hurting that release. They didn't mute it over people dying, over the health implications of some of the things that he was saying. It was only when it affected the construction, the erection, and the release of 5G masks across the UK, um, Ofcom actually muted him. But then in, in pre preparation for this um, um, session, I went on, on some social, okay, I can mention because they're not here. I went on Facebook and all his videos are still there. All his videos are still there. So I think social media is doing a lot of work in, in putting the information out there. It, I, I, I commend Emmanuel's team because, you know, holding together all the strands of the different, you know, the NGOs, the governmental bodies, the what can we say, what can't we say, what should we allow, what shouldn't we allow, I think we could do more when it comes to quelling the misinformation and actually, as soon as it comes out, if there's a video saying, oh, there's no such thing as COVID, oh, you don't need to put a stamp on it, register it as, I know it can be done because I saw it done during the American elections. They put a stamp on information that simply wasn't factual. 
Yes, some really powerful pointers there on why we need to nip it in the bud. Immediately it happens, that needs to be stopped on the tracks. And we see Carol Hatchett uh, mentioning, um, uh, it's an interesting perspective of what we're discussing because in the UK it said that misinformation about COVID-19 is being spread by young people who have read stories on social media and then discussed with their parents from having, um, they have dis dissuaded their parents um, from having the vaccine. Please do share your opinions, continue sharing your opinions, perspective, and even questions, um, please, in the Q&A, and we'd be able to address that. Now, Jackie, SciDev.net recently launched um, the Africa Science Focus Series. And in the three episodes published so far, um, you've looked at COVID-19 cases and deaths, the spread of meats and misinformation among communities and coronavirus vaccine hesitancy. Could you tell us what inspired this series and what you hope to accomplish through it? Because we need more and more of such programs to just you know, disseminate information around health. Okay, so what inspired us is, for example, I have story, Rachel's story. There is lots of misinformation going around on um, WhatsApp messages, on messaging apps all over Sub-Saharan Africa. And we felt it's our responsibility to quell this. So we've had 34 episodes so far. And, um, you know, because of the misinformation spreading around Sub-Saharan Africa, and this is our terrain, and you know, Africa has a history of a, a history of vaccine hesitancy, drug hesitancy. They have trust issues, especially coming from government, and um, and because African knowledge is not as documented as the West, so it is easy for manipulation. It's easy for people to manipulate information, like you know how uh, if we had information that are well documented in Africa, like it is, that's why anybody can come and say anything and it's believed and it's, it, it looked like true. You know, there was a time, the Ebola crisis in Nigeria where someone said that if you use salt to have your bath, you won't get Ebola. And a lot of people were having salt breaths and it resulted in, in a lot of um, health crisis. So we felt that it's our responsibility to make sure that we quell these unfounded beliefs and then um, around health information and all whatnot. Then we felt that, okay, we should have a podcast to bring in the novice, the normal people, normal African is a human angle story where scientists, policymakers, everybody come together under one umbrella. We are all in the same conversation. The man on the street on one episode is talking about the meat and information, whatever information they are sharing. She, they come to the podcast and talk about it. We get an expert to tell this person that this is not a correct information. Then she talks about the information and the facts that he needs to or she needs to hear. Then we add this, you know, it's such a rural, um, anybody is on our on, on our podcast so we talk about this thing so that we 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 um, equip them with the, the right information and they go ahead and disseminate to their communities so we've been able to build that safe platform for everyone to talk about come together and talk about meat misinformation whatever health information that are wrong we bring it out and we talk about it and we have a science and science answer and question segment where anybody listening to the podcast and ask any question then we get experts to answer them so we feel that if you have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with people listening to us you know it starts from the grassroots the more you empower one person it goes around the circle so that's one of the reasons why we had our podcast and it has been rewarding because each episode we see people coming in with answers with questions and we are making a lot of impact on that there's a lot wow. of stories on but well, it's just too much to cover out but yeah yeah that's really amazing um jackie i think empowering people with the correct and accurate information is really critical and just emmanuel permeating from what rachel did talk about how we call this um fake stories or misinformation, um, you know, how does Twitter ensure protecting the public uh, conversation and containing the spread of misleading and high risk content? Is it only that people need to report it or are there any other initiatives that um, Twitter has undertaken to prevent this? No, it's a really good question, Elizabeth. So 
I think from, from we have uh, we have tackled this problem from the product policy and capacity building kind of perspective. As it pertains to policy, we've uh, what we've done is we've broadened our definition of harm to really address content that goes against any guidance provided from credible sources such as the WHO and other regional health bodies, really to, to make sure that people have access to that information. So we have then, as it pertains to broadening our definition, what we do remove, we have a zero tolerance policy and what we remove is any denial of global or local health authority recommendations, uh, any descriptions again of at least cures, um, any denial of scientific facts or any information that propagates uh, false and misleading information around COVID-19 diagnostics. And as, as we have uh, fairly and accurately discovered with this pandemic, nothing, nothing can be done in isolation, but rather in partnership. Uh, so we've then, at least as in my role as the Sub-Saharan Africa lead on the policy front, I've been having conversations and one conversation I've had which was quite helpful to learning about realities and problems on the ground as it pertains to the African continent was with, uh, uh, with the office of the uh, youth envoy, Af Africa youth envoy, they had established an initiative by the name of Africa Youth on Coronavirus. So we had, we had a training, had conversation to kind of learn how different youth organizations are tackling the issue. So it, it, that provided us a lot of context on how to further or improve our engagement. And as you can maybe confirm, Elizabeth, we've been working with UMREF ever since the pandemic commenced on how to really tackle this issue from an information standpoint. So we've been discussing with AMREF and even as it pertains to the journalist program that AMREF offers to healthcare journalists, we've agreed to support us, uh, particularly from a capacity building front, as I mentioned earlier, but government has been a critical part of this uh, conversation. So we have provided different advertisement grants to different governments so that they can utilize our platform or leverage our platform to amplify credible information that they have. Um, so uh, we are currently actually, as we speak and since, uh, vaccine related misinformation has been a topic that has come at us recently. We are currently working with a number of governments globally, but as it pertains to the African continent, with a number of governments on uh, creating a, a, health, a vaccine misinformation prompt so that when people search for COVID-19 related vaccines, they will be directed to a credible uh, site of an agency dealing with healthcare related issues. And even beyond this, so as I said, policy product is great and capacity building is also great as well, but we kind of would like to provide people access, uh, be it academia and developers to our API set so that people can actually study the proper conversation as it is happening. And it's also another initiative of ours to be transparent about the way we go about different enforcements, but also uh, giving people access to the, to the real time public conversation happening on our platform so that this phenomenon even beyond COVID can be studied from, from its root causes and also enabling at the same time other institutions to really uh, take advantage of what Twitter has to provide in this end. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Manuel, for that. And yes, I can confirm that we've been working on a number of initiatives to curb misinformation as AMREF um, together with Twitter. And if there are any media practitioners in the audience, please do visit our AMREF International University website to just see how you can be part of that um, and how you can sign up for those sessions. Now, coming to you, Dr. Moby, as a thought leader in this field, and considering the vested interests lying behind some of the region's most influential media outlets, how can the media, especially the African-owned media, reposition themselves as truly unbiased um, in order to combat health skepticism and misinformation with compelling evidence-based information. Thank you, Liz. That is actually the key word, evidence-based. <laughs> because when it's evidence-based, it speaks for itself. It gains trust. And so the, the, uh, you know, uh, the African media must work very hard to end public trust. In a recent study I conducted with some of my colleagues, we found that there was a relatively low number of Nigerians who actually trust information reported by the media on COVID-19. You know, we had just 39.9%, uh, so roughly 40% of Nigerians believe what the uh, Nigerian media put out there in the public domain. It, it's even worse for government, for government had just 28%. While we had 
74.4% of respondents who trust health experts. So we find that the, this trust deficit, you know, uh, makes it important that the media work very hard. And some of the bias in the messages are as a result of, of ownership. You know, so the issue of trust brings to the fore the conflict interest facing the African journalist, where he has to, is, you know, he or she is put in a position where she has, uh, he or she has to choose between either being loyal to the owner or being loyal to uh, the, um, the profession. Um, so you find that sometimes, um, whether it's a government owned media outlet or it belongs to government, sometimes journalists um, participate in cover up of the information that are factual. They report just what is given to them and they don't ask the hard questions to uncover the truth. So they must follow the truth. They must report what is what the truth, the facts are, no matter whose ox is called. I know that sometimes the challenges they face is that of you know keeping your job because if your job is on the line when you tell the truth, you know because your owner might fire you or you you work for a government-owned media and the minister of health has told you some things which you know may not necessarily be true, and you just take them like that and report them without asking the hard questions. You are not being true to your profession. So my advice to African uh, journalists is that they must follow the story. They must follow it. They must uncover the facts and they must re report the facts. You see, my, uh, my, um, I have a, a, a professor who uh, in, was my mentor and he always said that a good machine has no unnecessary parts. If, yes, if you are good, you will be in demand. So you should not entertain the fear of losing your job because you're telling the truth. The truth must always win out at the end of the day. And it must be evidence-based. Because when it's evidence-based, everybody who reads it or sees it will know that this is the truth. And the person doesn't. So, you know, and then, you know, this, um, what is most important in, for, the, uh, for African uh, media to be, that they should also uh, collaborate with things like pe perhaps health experts to verify the information they get. And then when they get the, you know, some of this, you know, the, uh, what the, the truth, you know, and then um, there must also be clarity in their reporting. Because some, sometimes I know in Nigeria, there was a lot of uh, unclear stories coming out before the vaccines finally arrived in Nigeria. We were given different conflicting dates from government sources. Some would say to come in February, some said March, some said April, until finally when it arrived. And you know, there's nothing that causes um, it's a catalyst for misinformation than when you know messages are conflicting. And so people capitalized on it and they were sending all sorts of messages. And if you go and you know, there's no uh, medium that is as um, um, what culpable as WhatsApp in spreading misinformation. You find that even when the vaccines have arrived and they have started injecting the vaccines, you find people you know, spreading stories on, on, on uh, WhatsApp, on Instagram, saying ah, that there's nothing, the uh, syringes are empty. They are just, you know, that this is a, a photo op, that there's nothing, no, no the liquid in the syringe and things like that. And so our leaders have to cl give clear messages and journalists have to report the truth. That is what the African media owes the public. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mobi. Indeed, you are spot on where journalists need to follow the story irrespective of the odds that they face. And you know, there's a punchline you've given us. A good machine has no unnecessary parts. I think that's something that we'll definitely take home after the um in this session. Um, coming to you, Ian. And just permeating from what Dr. Amobi has talked about, you know, being in the newsroom for a number of years, you've seen that um, health news get deprioritized. It's quite unfortunate that it had to take a pandemic for health news to be sort of like story one, story two, and have features around health. Um, in your perspective, what opportunities do you see for media outlets 
and other um, stakeholders to collaborate to bring health news to the fore and in that way tackle the spread of misinformation and disinformation. Uh, thanks, Liz. And I think I'll answer that question uh, two parts quickly. I see, I feel that it is time for governments and organizations to stop relying on news outlets to get their message out there. In this day and age where we have social media and all these platforms where you can communicate to whatever you'd like uh, and reach uh, the masses, then we should not wait for a news bulletin to uh, give you priority of some sense. I, I see a future where, and if I think it's already happening, where organizations actually employ content creators or even journalists to package their message and channel uh, them out there uh, on the different platforms so that we don't wait for the traditional uh, news kind of reporting. But also at the same time, it's definitely a challenge for us journalists and uh, editors in newsrooms to really look at the issues. Uh, because uh, taking Kenya, for example, we are, we are still in the middle of a pandemic and we are about one and a half, uh, one and a half years to the elections and as you can see right now uh, the bulletins do not have you know covid as part of their top stories the countdown of the numbers of people infected has actually moved to the second part of the bulletin it means that not enough resources are being are being taken towards that but also at the same time i feel like in newsrooms we need to really understand our audiences and also take advantage of the different platforms again to channel uh, kind of half targeted uh, messaging or targeted uh, content being let out there. If it is news, you do know that, uh, for instance, 9 p.m. is kind of usually tailored for uh, you know, maybe an older generation or perhaps uh, men and women who are interested in, in the politics of the day. Whereas, you know, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and all these other platforms, you can actually take advantage and, and tailor the message and maybe focus on health. Uh, and maybe I think I see you know, let's make it a strategy in terms of how we uh, we kind of report the news, but also at the same time try to really uh, balance the the issues that we are reporting. Liz. Okay, thank you, Ian. Now moving on to Rachel as an as a communication specialist. Um, I know you've handled a lot of whether it's traditional media or digital media, but my question is more going <clears throat> into digital media. Um, from your experience, as more people turn to digital channels for information and entertainment, what strategies can stakeholders in health, from media outlets to development organizations, use to spotlight accurate information and drown out misleading content with authoritative facts? Uh, thank you for that question. I think a lot of the answers have started coming out as we've gone through this conversation. Um, so I know right at the at the peak of the pandemic, uh, for example, Google pinned uh, COVID news right at the top of their search bar of, of the homepage, even before you saw the doodle, right? Uh, whether you're on mobile or whether you are on the web application, you would see COVID information first. I think uh, digital uh, houses could maybe think about doing something similar. Um, could we maybe force everyone to follow WHO, for example, that that's one uh, handle that you can't unfollow, for example, during the period of um, important news or make sure that that news is pinned to the top of the, the, um, the news. I, I, I say this because I, when, I, when I'm speaking and I'm thinking about um, social media and how they can come into, uh, into being here, um, I'm thinking more and more about Twitter just because Twitter is so real time, it's so live. Facebook, there's a lot of pontification and people write long essays and things like that. But Twitter is where the news tends to break. So would it be possible? I don't know if it's possible. I don't know how the machinations work. Um, say, for example, to have a certain piece of news trending all day. You can't remove it. Any other thing that trends organically or paid should be number two. And downwards, for example, is that possible? Um, would it be possible to, um, for YouTube to play a 10 second video that can't be skipped? I know they play videos that you can't skip when, <clears throat> when they wish to commercialize it. Maybe there should be a 10 second video 
all over the world in any language you need it to be in that, okay, before you get onto the content that you want to watch, you need to watch this. Um, traditional, um, so uh, Dr. Moby said something about um, traditional news media and things like that. And they have, they have in the past been very, very good at um, working with local communities when it comes to accessibility, using that language that the local communities can understand, having posters in traditional languages all around, you know, having newspapers that the bus garage boys can understand, as well as content that the CEOs can also um, relate with. I think where the ball was dropped a little bit here was um, the crossover to not quite social media. So someone has mentioned WhatsApp, for example. Um, all our aunties have spread mats on, <laughs> on WhatsApp and they're talking about, you know, plastic rice and they're talking about all this kind of stuff. And we didn't have, I, I'm going to speak about Nigeria because I, I can't speak about Kenya uh, and the rest of, of sub-Saharan Africa, but certainly um, I was very hopeful and very disappointed to find out that we didn't have like a, a USSD function where you could get information. There was no quick number that you can get information in any of the three main languages, say Yoruba, Hausa, and Igbo. We didn't have a WhatsApp number that you can quickly call because that's where our people are, right? It, even if you had, the, there's, there's, the, we have um, pay plans like credit, pla uh, credit phone, credit plans mm -hmm. that allows you free access on on WhatsApp, for example, and that's where they could have contacted the people if they really wanted to. We could have had. Um, uh, you know, nationwide spread of information in Pigeon, uh, as Dr. Amobi very rightly mentioned, um, and we just didn't have that. And then there was no, um, it just seemed like Twitter's doing all this work in their little chamber. Facebook is doing this work in their little chamber. And if you ask these people, they're doing this work in their little chamber. And there was no one organization connecting and bringing all these different bodies together to say, well, how can we send out a whole <laughs> message to people that just didn't exist. And the, unfortunately, as much as we would like to work with the government, it can be very difficult to work with government because government is by its very nature politicized. So if, they, if there's nothing in it for them to either promote a message or quell a message, they're just not going to do it. So unfortunately, it falls to media houses and stakeholders and WHOs and the NDDCs and, and people like that to do what they can to bring all of this together. So I definitely think that there are things that we could do when it comes to health. Once again, I think it just matters, intentionality matters, the will to do it, because we have amazing will, like I've said, when it comes to politics, when it comes to elections, we see countries turn around and change laws if they want to. It just depends on if someone thinks COVID-19, Ebola, HIV, any of the massive life-changing diseases that we have had. And by the way, if the statistics are anything to go by, we are just going to start seeing more diseases at a much more, you know, at a lightning pace, just start coming out. We're already talking about COVID mutations <clears throat> and strains. So if we don't get it right now, <laughs> you know, uh, America's lost 500 million people. I don't know what the uh, figures are for. Uh, I know the UK is not far behind. I don't know what the figures are for um, SSA, Sub-Saharan Africa, but what happens the next time, unfortunately, when there is a pandemic? And there will yeah. be a next time because that's just where the world is going, unfortunately. So, um, it's, it shouldn't be our cross to carry, but we are the people that, um, sorry, just one more thing, and I know I'm taking a lot of time. Dr. Amobi had mentioned something about um, credibility and trust with the government when it comes to, um, she, she mentioned some figures, I think 40% around the government, um, people believing what the government says. People don't just wake up and start believing you. You have to build credibility. So if that's not the place where I go to for news, we need to empower the micro-influencers, the place that the young people go to for news, to spread the news the young people are willing to believe in. If the government has, quote unquote, let me down in the past, they're not the place I'm going to go to when I want to find out how to take care of my health. So their credibility has nothing to do with 
There are people dying. We need to get the information out to them. Who are the people they listen to? Who are the people they believe? These are the people we need to empower and enable with information and then make sure that the information we get to them is pushed to the top of all the media outlets consistently all the time until no other news makes its way until even a fisherman in the most remote village says oh no that's not right no i, I checked on my phone even with nokia 3310 to be able to say no that's not what they told me on my phone no the real message is this 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 and that's where we need to get to thank you very much i'm sorry indeed rachel thank you i can tell the passion from the way you're speaking about the topic so thank you so much for all those very valid insights uh, now, just going to Jackie, and I'm going to combine your question with one of the questions that's been asked within the platform. And please do keep those questions coming in. I know when you're doing the podcast, I know SciDev does a lot of science and health reporting, and you get to speak to a lot of opinion leaders and health experts. So how are you able to distinguish the evidence from presumptuous talk, um, from just opinion, and then how do you get to generate new information given the information explosion? I've combined that question with a question from Frederick Majiwa. Over okay, so um, first, all right, thank you so much, Liz, thank you. And um, I must tell you that at SciDev, we follow the story and we ask the hard questions because, you know, misinformation is becoming very hard to fight and we can't bring a knife to a gun battle. So we need to be battle ready because it has become a life and death situation. So we teach our journalists to be very critical in their reporting and we teach them how to differentiate between um, credible and questionable news data sources. We, most of our stories comes from already published science works, meaning that we have to do a story, we go straight to the authors of those stories, we ask them questions, we tell them to talk about their research and clarify. So we don't do stories out of the blues, we do stories from mostly published stories, we ask independent experts to come on our stories, we are not in a hurry to do our stories, we want to make sure that we get our stories right, always verify from the main sources. Luckily, we have um, our script training courses at SciDev.net. We recently launched a course that is helping journal both science, especially in a pandemic such as COVID. And most importantly, we have a course that teaches, you know, teaches scientists and journalists how to communicate with each other because there is usually a bridge, a gap between the scientists and the journalists. Sometimes because of brain drain, they have a lot of things to do. It's difficult for them to answer questions as quickly as we want them to. So we invite them to these courses. We have webinars where scientists and our journalists constantly need to talk about these stories. So because we know that there is a big war between fact, fake news and facts. So we need to make sure that we keep the same energy with the people spreading the fake news. We just don't want to leave, oh, this is fake news and we are we are soft about it. We are very proactive at SciDev.net. We make sure that um, we are sending out the right information as regular and as quickly as possible. We want to make sure that we broaden our own social circles. There's a lot of messaging apps, there's TikTok, there's Snapchat. We want to get involved in those communities so that we also be in there and send out our messages. So. Combating fake news is, is not a deep thing, it's an ongoing thing. It means that journalists and editors need to be given more work. We need to have a collective, we need to have a place where offline influencers, online influencers are all together. We need to have like doing podcasts, we, we bring in youth leaders in communities and villages, even religious leaders people that have great influence in their in communities to come and talk about these things. We want to bridge the gap as much as possible, make sure that we are sitting on the same table talking about these things because people have died due to falsified information. We can't take it lightly. We need to make sure that um, all, all our new sources are verified. Just like I said oh. earlier, we are not in a hurry. And you know, because we are in a crisis, just like Dr. Gita, he said earlier that in time of crisis, we shouldn't waste it. We never waste a crisis because it is at this period we get solutions that solve our problems. So, you know, it's, it's ongoing. In, inside of the .NET reporters, we are 
more like on the 24 hour clock where we make okay. sure that all our news are verified. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Jackie. I'd really like us to cover all the questions that, that have been asked. So please keep your answers very short and to the point. And this I take to Emmanuel, an anonymous attendee, hello anonymous, is asking, what would you say to companies in the healthcare industry who have had accurate information flagged or taken down by social media companies due to certain words or images inaccurately recognized as inappropriate? Um, very quickly on that, Emmanuel. Uh, well, well, on those instances, I think, you know, mistakes can, can definitely happen. But what we have done in order to, for us to really protect the public conversation around COVID, we have kind of updated our policies around advertisement. As such, um, only people or companies or institutions that had an, were whitelisted to do so on our platform were allowed to do so. So there's, there's actually a way to apply for this. And once companies and institutions are whitelisted, they are allowed to advertise and utilize any terms related to COVID. But this is a policy update that was made in order for us to protect the public conversation, given the, the real time nature of Twitter, where not everything can be flagged as such. We, we did then update our policies to kind of meet the needs. And one of the mistakes that the, the, the person asking this question might have happened in the past, but this is something we're taking very seriously. And if there's such an instance, uh, this can be reported and we're happy to, to look into it even much further. Great, thank you for that. And then very quickly, Esther Wabuge is asking, our societies associate credibility of information with the source and most commonly leaders, political, spiritual, etc. When these leaders speak, um, inaccurate information or don't echo the correct information, there's a gap. How can journalists and the media, um, you know, fill this gap? Um, I will ask Ian to answer that very quickly. All right. Uh, uh, thanks for that, Esther. And I think um, the thing here is, first of all, journalists and media organizations need to maintain their own credibility. And what the BBC has done is um, really ensure that we are impartial in everything we report. There's even guidelines as to how and, and what we can put out there as journalists within the organization. So that alone builds the credibility in that if anyone sees a tweet coming from me, they'll have to take it as gospel uh, truth because they know that we have gone through the guidelines of BBC and also I as a journalist have that kind of credibility. Also, I've realized with fact checking, sometimes it can actually prove to be boring and kind of the same things, but I've also realized that what's obviously fake to you is someone else's truth. So no fact check is too obvious and therefore we need to keep fact checking these stories to uh, keep um, building kind of digital literacy with our audiences so that they can also uh, learn to identify what's fake and what's not, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ian. Ruth Koshal says, thanks for this really interesting session. How do we move from traditional communication to social and behavior change communication resulting in changes in knowledge, attitude, and practice? And I think that's the same question that Solomon Tamerat is asking. Dr. Moby, do you want to take that? And uh, let me have the question again. Sorry, Dr. Amobi just from oh, great. So um, there's a question here that says, how do we move from traditional communication to social and behavior change communication resulting in changes in knowledge, attitude, and practice? Okay. Um, thank you. Um, we, we can do that by engaging the uh, stakeholders, you know, in what is called, um, you know, participatory kind of communication, where the, you know, the, um, the people that are the, where the target audience also participates in identifying what the objective or the goal of the communication is, and they become part of the implementation or the sending. So once they are carried along, then you find that, you know, um, social change can be achieved, you know, and then you, you have to use not just the traditional uh, 
uh, channels of communication, radio, and so on. You include other community-based um, channels. You include uh, interpersonal channels, so you have group discussions and all that. Then you have community-based where you have theater, dance, music, you know, you use certain things that can appeal, you know, to them. And then you use opinion leaders, because that, that also takes me to what um, Ian talked about, you know, um, in, um, when, he talk, when he addressed the issue of source credibility. When you use leaders that are trusted to participate in disseminating information, then it is more believable traditional leaders, you use religious leaders, these are people that are respected in society. You identify, but you must identify first and for everything circles back to the target audience. When you get to the target audience, you find those who are their opinion leaders or influencers, those that they trust. And when you identify those that are trusted, then you use them to disseminate this information. Uh, because we have theories underlying this, like the two-step flow theory that talks about opinion leaders being the ones more exposed to the media and then, you know, sending information from the, the you know, to opinion followers. So these things are very potent and can help achieve social change, you know, but first and foremost is that there has to be participation between those that, you know, uh, you know all the stakeholders must be in, involved in the communication process. They all identify their problems, they all decide the, you know, uh, the solutions, and they all implement the solutions together. So that is how you can move from the traditional means of communication where you, it's, it's, it is top down. You know, you just come, you know, you have a message and you send it to the receiver, to the horizontal one, which everybody is on the same, on the equal playing field, and everybody is, you know, they have, work together to achieve the desired goal and it is only when this is done that you have uh, you you can't talk about uh, achieving social change or behavioral change thank you thank you thank so you. much Mr. Amobi, for those very amazing insights we've come to the tail end of this discussion um, I know it's very interesting. It can go on forever. We'll definitely have more sessions in the coming weeks post a hike talking about misinformation and disinformation. But before we let you all go to my panelists in just 30 seconds, I have a final question for you. And the question is, what in your opinion is one thing we can all do collectively, whether as individuals or part of a community to tackle misinformation within our circles of influence and to improve media literacy in just 30 seconds. And I'll start with Rachel. You're on mute. I would say we just all have to step up to the plate and choose within our spheres of influence to speak up. Um, that could be either as you are just uh, an individual or an employee, or um, I know, for example, that within um, news outlets and social media outlets and things like that, a lot of the staff put a lot of pressure on how the policies within the organizations came up with how they you know, what sort of decisions they made regarding information and how it was passed. So I think um, what is everybody's job is nobody's job. If you say, oh, we should all, no. Within yourself, by yourself, as a human being, what steps are you taking to make a difference? What steps are you taking to verify the information you're putting out there? Um, I think as long as everybody takes responsibility for the information they put out there, that makes it um, easier to to mitigate and regulate the information that's in the open space. Thank you. Thank you very much. Emmanuel? Uh, I think from a personal standpoint, probably um, really being self-aware of the kind of information that may come out, out of a person's or keep, to keep the person out of my mouth when I speak to my, be my peers, my family, my, my siblings. Um, but I think from a, from a company standpoint, it's just really a matter of continuing to engage in partnership with different organizations um, to, to really learn a similar engagement that we've been having, Elizabeth, with AMREF, where AMREF really provides us the opportunity to, to learn about different certain realities happening on the ground, while we can offer our platform 
which can be leveraged to amplify credible information. So I think it's always a matter of, of partnership. And if, if, there's, if there's something that this pandemic has taught us, is that nothing can be achieved substantially in isolation, but rather in partnership. Wow, that's, that's quite powerful. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Um, next up, Jackie. Okay, I would say, sorry. Okay, I would say that the most important thing is that we broaden our own online service. We build an online and offline community. Find it, have a great relationship with um, community leaders, religious leaders. Those are the people at the point of these communities. We need to, even us as speakers here, we need to do something as well. We just can't do this as one of. We need to come together and do something as well. So that's how it starts. Everybody should be responsible to do something instead of waiting for the, pe the next person. Why not you? Yeah, exactly. It starts with I. Thank you so much, Jackie. Dr. Amobi? You're on mute. <laughs> For me, I teach members of my circle to consume information with some degree of skepticism and suspicion and not to believe everything they read on the public domain, especially on social or instant messaging platforms. Like Ian said, there are several media organizations or media outlets that have built up credibility. And so when I read certain things, I immediately go back to find out whether those stories are you know, reported on these media outlets. And if they, they are, then I begin to, you know, uh, uh, you know, put some believability in it. So I teach people, I teach my students, I teach my relatives and all that, because sometimes you find them, they post certain things on social media. And you find that some videos, you know, they may just say, for instance, in Lagos, you just see a message on WhatsApp saying, Ah, don't go to Jebo, the, uh, Lagos, Jebo, the road, though. they are headsmen, they are just killing people and all that, they just killed that many people. And you see videos, and believe you me, when, you, when these videos are verified, they are probably something that happened in Rwanda during the genocide, you know? And they are posting it and telling you that it's happening right now on the Lagos, Jebo, the road. So what I do is never to reshare information that I have not verified i am and i'm not completely sure that it has happened so when i get certain messages like that i immediately send them to a, a africa check a fact checking organization yeah. and ask them to you know, verify for me you know sometimes i'm even you know they use that you know to um fact check and put the, the uh, correct story out there so that is what i so i teach my students my relatives my, my immediate family, my colleagues, my friends, and all that, that, you know, because you find that some of these sources yeah. and some of these stories come from sources that you would never believe would send those kinds of things. That's so true. many, That's so many people are full of conspiracy theories. And so they put them out there. And so you have to be very careful. And this is what I teach people that they have to be very careful in consuming. But some people don't even know when messages that they get have been forwarded from another source. So the moment they get that message, they believe that it is the source they get it from that send that message to them. And that is why they believe those messages without knowing that those people were sharing messages that they too you know, got from another source. So I am not quick to reshare messages. And I tell people, those who care to listen, that they should be very careful about sharing messages that are not trusted. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Moby. It's very important to ensure that you ensure the source of your information. Do not just blindly reshare. And last but not least, Ian. Thank you, Liz. By the simple reason that we are on, uh, we're all using the internet, and the fact that we are also uh, consumers of, inf of information online, we are all fact checkers by design. So we should always be on the lookout for information that is not credible, and so we can try to kind of educate the people who follow us. And if you're an organization, or if you are, uh, you know, someone from government, here are just three qu quick pointers of how you can effectively combat misinformation through effective communication. 
one, analyze what people are talking about on social media. And then two, give available information. What do we know so far? Remember, like I'd said earlier, information thrives in the absence of, um, misinformation thrives in the absence of information. So don't be quiet with what you know so far, just communicate step by step. And then also balance in assurance. Sometimes we understand in this day and age, people want to consume information as fast as they can. It does not hurt to actually say, we do not know everything, but this is what we know so far and we're working on it. And then of course, uh, communicate uncertainty and then understand your audiences. So if you're channeling information to Instagram, people on Instagram do not consume the same information the same way people on Twitter do. And I think, Liz, that is just how you can actually ensure that your information is communicated effectively. And that way we come a step closer to combating misinformation. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. That was really spot on from all of you. Thank you so much. We could go on talking forever. I think we need a part two of this conversation. So please be open for that. But I want to take